just let everybody mute themselves and we will go over to John Miller now. So good, good afternoon or good morning from Edinburgh. And first of all, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel. The panel is Alan Dean, formerly a member of the New York Brass Quintet, trumpeter Ray Mace and bass trombonist John Rojak, currently members of the American Brass Quintet, Simon Hogg, trombonist, the founder member of Fine Arts Brass Ensemble in Birmingham, UK, Nearer home, Tony George, the British tubist, ophicleidist and discoverer, and John Wallace, finally, the founder of the Wallace Collection in 1986. Um, now, really, to, to set the scene for this um, round table discussion, um, I'll, I'm going to sort of speak a little bit about the establishment of the brass quintet and other familiar mm -hmm. types of ensembles after World War II. Um, <coughs> These are precursors, of course, and it was very reassuring to hear um, Albert Perrin's comments on the Bellum in, in 1856. So thank you very much, um, Sandy Coffin, for that, not to mention the music of Victor Ewald. But you see, preparing for this discussion today, it's a very happy coincidence that one of the distance debut concerts in, th in 1835 was here in Edinburgh less than a mile from this very spot. And, uh, and it's funny that my introduction to this session, this cross pond discussion keeps on returning to Edinburgh. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a fast forward in Edinburgh into the mid 20th century. Now the Edinburgh International Festival <coughs> launched in 1947, immediately following World War II. <coughs> And even at its inception, it was the foremost of such events in this country. And this was the very time when recognizable types of modern brass ensemble came into being both sides of the Atlantic. Now, Edinburgh was a very important port of call of American orchestras who crossed the pond to do their European tours. Now, um, New York Philharmonic came here in 1951 with Metropolis, now, Metropolis conducted Gunter Schuller's Brass Symphony in New York City six years later. That was a famous event for us. Now, the Boston Symphony Orchestra came here um, five years later. Boston Symphony Orchestra came here in August 1956 for five days at the festival with Charles Munch and Pierre Monteux. During this trip, a chamber concert at the Freemasons Hall included Poulenc's trio and two recent American works played by the Boston players. Now, um, they, they made a rather um, important record called The Modern Age of Brass with Cap Records, you know, in 1956, it says Roger Voisin and the Brass Ensemble, including Ingolf Dahl, Music for Brass Instruments, 1944. Now, some people consider that this is maybe the start of an American timeline of modern works. Now, it's can also contemporaneous with recordings made by the Chicago players, and the New York Philharmonic, and I bet there are others as well. And um, all of this, to me, it, 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 um, <coughs> it um, indicates a very serious intent. Now, if we go just a little bit earlier um, to Tanglewood in 1948. At Tanglewood in 1948, there was a brass chamber muse and a brass chamber coach taken by Jacob Rachman. He was the Boston's Russian trombonist. Now, the same year as that, um, the trumpeter Robert Nagel, who was also a founder of the New York Brass Quintet, he studied with Aaron Copeland. You know, the, the, uh, the, there were brass players who were very, very involved and keen to sort of uh, keen to expand their activities. Um, I think it's possible we might touch back on Tanglewood at a later, a later stage. But look, the same year, 1948. Now, that's when Philip Jones graduated from the Royal College of Music in London. And um, one of his very first professional engagements was playing at the second international festival here in Edinburgh. And there, there he met the Concertgebouw Orchestra's first trumpet, Marinus Komst. 
Now, Combs had a, a strong commitment to chamber music and with his Concertgebouw Quartet. Now, this stimulated Jones. Jones, um, I think, I think it, it, it sort of um, struck him very deeply that they had the same sort of seriousness of purpose. And I think the Concertgebouw's Quartet, its association with a very established orchestra, was a big factor. Now, the Philip Jones Brass Ensemble, um, from, its, uh, from its foundation in 1951 to about 1961 and 1962, it didn't really do a great deal. It was quite, it was quite modest in, in its scope, but really that thing changed because um, Jones, he worked very hard in that period to refine the ensemble's performance practice. And he thought, well, how do you play a brass instrument as a real chamber music? And that's what he worked at with, he, with, his, was with his quartet. Now, one of his big changes was hearing Malcolm Arnold's quintet in 1961. And that wasn't written for Philip Jones. It was, it was, it was, it was written for the New Yorkers, you know. Um, but it made a big impression on, on brass playing in Britain. But there was a bigger impression than that. Um, the New York Brass Quintet came on a European tour in 1963. And um, on the tour, they played at the American Embassy in London. And it was um, Robert Nagel, Ted Weiss, John Burroughs, John Swallow, and the tubist Harley, Harvey Phillips. Now, they played a big program. It was a Banker Sanger leader and some Bach, Victor Evald's Symphony, and um, Malcolm Arnold's Quintet, Maurer's Suite for Brass Quintet, Collier Jones's Four Movements, Gunter Schuller Music for Brass, and to finish off, the Bozza Sonatina. And um, Jones, he hadn't heard brass players playing anything like this. It was like a sprint and a marathon combined. And um, it was revelatory for him. And it was revelatory for him to hear tuba playing of this type from Harvey Phillips. You know, um, I think that um, um, in Britain, the tuba was played very well, but it was played in a different manner. You know, um, I think the Bozza Sonatina, written away back in 1951 for the Brass Quintet of the Guard Republican, and um, it wasn't really performed in the UK until the 70s. So, you know, so things really changed. Um, these, were, these, were, these were very definite American influences that struck home with, with uh, Jones and many others. Now, I think there were other, you know, further setting the scene, I think there were other things happened, some of them very well known, others lesser known. I think the big thing that was well known was that big Gabrielli record, Antiphono music of Gabrielli in, in 1961, in 1969, that won the Grammy. Now, this was discussed very perceptively by Lisa Malamut on Monday. Um, Lesser known than that and is that um, there was a, a record, Baroque Fanfares and Sonatas for Brass, that was made by Nunsuch in 1966 by the London Brass Players, directed by Joshua Rifkin. Now, this is a, it's a rather exceptional player. The London Brass Players is the Philip Jones Brass Ensemble in all but name. It's quite an extended thing, but um, it has some full continuous instruments. It has two vocal solos, the whole caboodle, and it has all the details on the sleeve notes of all the sources. You know, this is this was um, really quite unique. So, to, so it was a, it was an, an American um, um, enterprise, Tracy Stern and none such. Um, coming across to London, um, for maybe for a performance practice, but bringing a lot of expertise with them. Um, another record that conveys a lot of expertise for me is a, a, a record called American Brass Record, American Brass Music, also 1969 by Nunsuch. It's the, this time it's the American Brass Quintet, um, Charles Ives from the Steeples to the Mountains. As a piece that's for me, it's very difficult to pronounce by Ives, Chromati Melod Tune. Um, with field drum and cymbals and, I mean, the whole caboodle. Um, the Charles Ives is performed with the carillon of, um, of Riverside Church, New York. And um, the, the chromatic mellow tune was realised by Jerry Schwartz, you know. Um, lots of interesting things coming our way that, um, that, that fed into our culture. Um, by the 1970s, there were more obvious cross-pond convergences. 
Um, one of the one of the most known ones was a sort of international brass symposium, and I think that Alan Dean knows this one. Um, it was sponsored um, by the Institut de, uh, de Hautitude Musicale in Montreux in 1974. And then um, there were concerts given by the New York Brass Quintet and the Philip Jones Brass Ensemble um, individually and also combined. Now, the catalyst uh, of that was Jean-Pierre Mathes, the Swiss publisher and trumpeter. That was one thing. Um, another um, landmark, I think, for for um, for re really for um, Britain was really um, a, a premiere of the Elliot Carter Quintet. Um, that was in 1974. Um, also, the American Brass Quintet, introduced by the composer. So th these are very these are very targeted things. So you see you see I'm pinning I'm pinning pinpointing all sorts of things that happened, but um, I suspect there's very much more information yet to come. So really, um, on to the real business of this of this round table discussion. I mean, I want to get get on to the business of the rights of the knights of the round table. You know, now look, um, I, I've compiled a few slightly targeted questions, and I feel there may be quite a few more from the floor. So I'm going to just start the ball rolling, and I want to really start um, the ball rolling with uh, with Alan Dean. And then, um, and so, so Alan, I, I wonder, I mean, can you recall this brass conference in Montreux and how did it strike you? Um, uh, I remember it well, actually, despite the fact it was, what, 50 years ago or something. Um, uh, we, uh, we were actually on a, on a tour, I think, uh, but Harvey uh, was the Harvey Phillips uh, who had left the quintet by then uh, uh, was also very involved in this Institute of Advanced Musical Studies. Uh, um, and we were uh, uh, especially interested because uh, we were, I think, the only uh, group from the States that was there, even the individuals. There were uh, the Phillips Quintet was there as a quintet. Um, and then a bunch of all stars, <clears throat> uh, mostly European. Uh, Thibault was there for uh, uh, Iblan Schiato, uh, Michael Lynn, uh, uh, Dennis Wick was there. I think Civil was there. Alan Civil. Uh, it was quite an all star uh, event. Um, and the great part was that we were able to just play a brass quintet concert as Phillips Group did. And all these other poor guys had to get up and play solo recitals. <laughs> so for us, it was a very relaxed event, actually. Uh, the thing I remember most, uh, we did at least one uh, antiphonal piece together with uh, the Philip Jones uh, Quintet. I assume it was Gabrielli. I don't honestly remember. Uh, probably an eight part with the tubas and doubling on the bottom. Uh, but what I mostly remember is that since I played a lot of the early music in the uh, New York Quintet, um, uh, Philip and I sort of had a, a dueling uh, ornament uh, competition uh, <laughs> during that piece. Somehow it was great, great fun. Actually, we had to, it was really nice. And I, you know, I got to, to as we all did, get to know the, the people in the, in the Philip Jones group. I think Gary Howarth and I sort of had a, a nice relationship. We were, we were the other, you know, we were the other trumpets in each group. We weren't the second trumpets, but we were the the other trumpet, I with Bob Nagel and and uh, Gary with uh, Philip, uh, and he became a, a, a friend. I visited uh, him and his wife in London after that. Um, the whole conference was uh, <laughs> interesting. Uh, it was sort of uh, set up, <clears throat> uh, particularly from Harvey Phillips' standpoint. He wanted to organize an international brass society. So he had really pushed to get the Tuba Society going and the International Trumpet Guild and the Horn Society, that we all had these four different societies for each of the instruments. And Harvey really wanted to have an international brass society. He came with bylaws, he came with all sorts of things. And there was a big conference with all of us sitting around the table. And Harvey started to talk about the International Brass Society. And I was sitting next to Philip. And he leaned over to me and he said, 
he's really serious, isn't he? <laughs> I said, yes, he's really serious. That's Harvey Phillips talking. <laughs> and shortly after that, I believe it was Dennis, being Dennis uh, Wick, uh, said, uh, this all sounds very good, Harvey, but uh, over here, you know, we're very small countries and we see each other all the time. Uh, you know, the United States is a very large country and I can see the need for these uh, organizations in the States, but we don't really uh, feel the need for uh, such an organization here. <laughs> the whole idea went down the tubes in about 15 minutes. <laughs> There's never been an international brass society. And it wasn't totally killed by Dennis, but if you know his sense of humor and his uh, attitude about things, sometimes he could be a little negative. And it was fantastic. Uh, anyway, that, uh, and Thibault, I had a great time with Pierre Thibault, uh, uh, who's... Uh, uh, felt like an outlier being a French trumpet player there, but it was a couple of great stories about that, but that's for another day, probably. Anyway, it was an important event, I think, in many ways. There was a big competition, and, and both Phillips' group, I think, and at least our group, we sight-read a bunch of pieces that were submitted, and they gave a competition winner to Jan Bach, a composer from Illinois for Laudus, uh, which has become a pretty standard piece in the brass quintet literature. And that was when that piece really sort of first appeared. And I think Bob Nagel actually published it with his little company uh, shortly after that. Um, one other anecdote, I remember uh, a composer, uh, an expat from the States who lived, I believe, in Belgium, Stanley Weiner, uh, had a quintet, which uh, we also played sight read, uh, and, uh, and it didn't win. And Stanley was very upset. And, and he announced to the entire place that the reason his piece didn't win was that the New York Quintet had played it so badly. <laughs> that didn't go down too well. <laughs> and curiously, we ended up actually playing that piece a number of years later on community concerts. It was a pretty light uh, piece, and, uh, and we played it in Europe, and Stanley was there, and he approved. Anyway, it was, I, it was, it was a great event. I have very fond memories of 1972. Wow. A couple of years ago. Well, well, Alan, you've 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 touched on some some wonderful things, wonderful things here. I've got a, I've got all the programs of these things at, mm. at, at at home, and I sort of can pour over them in a little bit more detail. And it seems to me that this was uh, the start of some um, um, unprecedented interaction. And you, you see Phillips' little comment about um, the tuba player, about um, Harvey Phillips, was interesting. This guy's re actually really serious because I think <laughs> I think Philip he, he, he had sometimes he had difficulty in convincing the pro promoters and the musical establishment that brass music could be a serious thing. And uh, I think I think we, we we see things a little bit more differently today, or we see, see we we see see we see things um, um, differently at, even at that time as well in regard of contemporary music. But it wasn't a fait accompli. And um, really, I just want to pass on to John Wallace to follow this thread um, about about really it's, it's it's really about seriousness. But you see, um, I, I touched on Tanglewood in 1948. And um, thinking about the Edinburgh Festival in the 1950s, having a brass ensemble involved in such a pivotal way of, um, of um, giving a full concert in Edinburgh of, um, of serious brass ensemble and having a sort of a real serious coaching in Tanglewood in 1948, that, 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 that really um, that sends me a message of seriousness. And, um, and intent. Now, John, uh, um, I think that you visited Tanglewood since then, and I'm just wondering, did the seriousness prevail? Was, was it, was it, and was it fun? Well, it was uh, really, it, it was really, uh, um, I spent a lot of humorous time with American brass players, but as well, the, the crucial sort of, uh, foundational seriousness of the whole thing only uh, came searing through into my consciousness through visiting the United States. Uh, I went on a bicentennial tour with the LSO in 1976. And um, so I re remember going to hear the American Brass Quintet at the little Carnegie Recital Hall in 
1976. And uh, it was Howard Snell, Willie Lang and myself, we went to hear a concert because we just wanted to hear Jerry Schwartz and Louis Ranger. And it was the first time I'd ever seen anybody play a four valve E flat trumpet. The thing was, Willie and I were so, I mean, we got on the phone to Shilke straight afterwards. And then we got to a hotel later on in the tour, two boxes had arrived. And we both went up <laughs> and the next day we turned up at, and, and we'd done it all in secret from, this is chaps in the same section, you know? And then I, went to ta ta we went to Boston on that tour as well and that's when I learned that to be a really serious trumpet player you had to be a piece of work because I was trying to again get into the Boston Hall we were with the LSO we're playing the next day and the Boston Orchestra were in there and so Howard and I tried to get into a rehearsal and this guy Immaculate, he was about 25 in a blazer and everything, met us at the stage door and said, no, we weren't allowed to go into the rehearsal. And that was my first encounter with Rolf Smedvig. And, uh, and so he wouldn't let us, he wouldn't let it. And I, I became very friendly with him afterwards. And um, the, the, when I went to Tanglewood as well, uh, I got uh, an, what we call in Britain a bollocking from Roger Voisin for, for being on, <laughs> I was doing this bit of coaching and, uh, and I'd, I'd lost track of the time, I was jet lagged and stuff. And he, <laughs> and, he, and there was this presence at the side of the sta stage and he said, you sir, my turn now. Get off the stage. And that was my first introduction to Roger uh, uh, Voisin. But these sort of anecdotes are just the, the cross currents. I mean, the, the Edinburgh Festival was put together as part of the Mar Marshall Plan. It was part of the, you know, the reconstruction of Europe after the war. They were looking for somewhere. It looked a little bit like Salzburg. It wasn't. And so the first, con I've got a, a, a book at home with all the, you know, Furt Wangler, Karian, Toscanini, everybody for the reconstruction of Europe. It had to be a, a big festival bringing all these guys back. So Richard Strauss's Four Last Songs was premiered here with uh, Kirsten Flagstadt and, 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 and everything. And uh, then uh, it's these sort of incredible cross currents post-war uh, from America that influenced uh, all, of our, all of our playing. And it was the Americans who, who commissioned all the serious pieces uh, as well. You know, it was the American Brass Quintet and Elliot, Elliot Carter's piece and New York and the Malcolm Arnold and the Empire and Maxwell Davies in 1982. Meanwhile, back in Britain, we're playing, you know, little F and G march and stuff like that, weren't we, Simon? <laughs> so uh, that's what really uh, got to me is the essential seriousness of the American psyche, which, you know, uh, when it joined in the war, it, it made a solution, the Marshall Plan, just like Biden's four trillion now, reconstructed, it got Germany back on its feet, France, everybody, and it got our musical world, uh, you know, going even although it was this American influence, which often we actually denigrate, but when you see what's come out of it, it's we haven't copied what happened in America. We've taken on these influences and knocked our, you know, uh, knocked the ball and Andy Murray back over the back over the net. So it's been a very, very beneficial thing. And I just hope it, it keeps going. Sorry, I can talk for Scotland. So. That's John, that's brilliant. You know, there's a there's another aspect of brass playing and um, really quite unlike the the distance and quite unlike the 
the um, the Cornet Quartet in Berlin, and um, that's the very um, intellectual aspect. And um, that intellectual aspect, it, it existed in Britain um, after the Second World War, but it, it, just, it, it existed, re it really, uh, it, was, it was a thing that um, existed in parallel. It was a little bit like um, Bede Williams' um, Braided River. You know, you get all, the, you know, all, these, all these parallel strands. And I can give you a couple of examples. Um, you know, it would be, I think it's 1955, Tippett's Quartet for Four Horns. I mean, it was it was played by the Dennis Brain Horn Quartet in the in the Wigmore Hall. Another example is uh, Tippett's Preludium for Brass Bells and Percussion. It was performed by Dorati and members of the BBC <coughs> Symphony Orchestra. But that was quite a different strand from um, the activities of most um, brass ensembles up until that point. And um, I, I, I think really it was uh, it was it was uh, primarily the the um, American players that changed that. And um, Really, um, I just, I just think that I, I just, I just think that the, the um, contemporary music, um, in, I mean, it's my conjecture that contemporary music it gave brass playing a different type of platform that we didn't have beforehand, you know. And uh, I think things like the Elliot Carter's brass quintet, it was a, it was a big, it was a big occasion. And it was a big occasion that was really supported by the BBC and and Ray um, Ray Ray May. So I wonder. I mean, I wonder if you have any recollections of um, performing that piece and recording it for the BBC. Plenty of recollections. Yeah. Uh, so just to put it in a little uh, perspective, um, the American Brass Quintet, as you're saying, in the 1960s, I think, was really uh, looking to get a lot of new pieces written. Uh, felt with being encouraged by a lot of people in the United States to be uh, getting new repertoire. Um, there were pieces that I think still Joe Barami, uh, Charles Wittenberg, um, Ralph Shapey, these were these were some very aggressive contemporary music pieces that really kind of defined the American Brass Quintet. And I think by a few years before the Carter was written, maybe around 1970, I, I was not a member of the group in 1970. Uh, Jerry Schwartz was the a trumpeter in the group at that time who really, um, I think, pushed the envelope a great deal. Uh, Jerry was very well known in contemporary music circles. Uh, he was a wonderful trumpet soloist, uh, had quite a reputation internationally by then. And I think for that reason, he was able to um, you know, kind of get Elliot Carter's ear a little bit about the idea of writing a brass quintet, which up till that point, I really don't think uh, composers of maybe that stature were were sort of being approached or, or maybe had written pieces. So the piece came around. Uh, I joined the group in 1973. And just a, a little aside, uh, I no longer perform with the American Brass Quintet. I re retired from the American Brass Quintet in 2013. Uh, but in 1973, when I joined the group, the piece was kind of in the works. And it was the summer of 1974 when uh, the American Brass Quintet was in residence at Aspen Music Festival, where we've the group has been for you know 60 years or so. Um, it was then that uh, Carter came out to Aspen and sort of wrote the piece in sections along with uh, with consulting with us every week. So it really was a interesting time. Um, uh, he would come to rehearsal with uh, a section of the piece and see if we could, what we could do with it, and being. Uh, young players and being um, not wanting to seem like we couldn't do anything uh, or, or that we could do everything, we would frantically rehearse and practice these sections of the piece for a week. And when you come back the next week, we was, well, this is what we can do with this. And I want to say it was like 19 sections altogether, something like that, that he had written. It was the way he composed the piece. Um, and it wasn't until the end of the summer that we really understood how everything came together. The piece was still for this fragmented uh, bunch of things, but um, we were very involved in the comp composing of it. Uh, we premiered it for the BBC. Uh, the world premiere was for the BBC in, I believe, September of 1974. Uh, uh, and then we, we really played it a lot over the next few years. Uh, interesting that I don't think that uh, presenters and audiences necessarily knew what the piece was or what to expect, but um, seeing his name on the piece. I think we were we were playing it sometimes at concerts for, you know, more like community concerts or things or audiences who were certainly not, uh, uh, you know, well versed in, in modern contemporary brass music. So, but we did, we played it. And I want to say for several years, it was on pretty much every concert we played. 
Um, and well, I guess the rest is history a little bit with the Carter. We, we recorded it then, uh, and then we recorded it again sometime later. Uh, a second recording maybe came out in the late 1990s. I have to think about that, early 2000s. Uh, we did a more more modern version, or let's say, that, no, no, no different, but with the players who were in the quintet uh, in, in, you know, about 15, 18 years ago, something like that. Um, Car Carter's very interesting on this piece, you know, I mean, uh, um, in, in the stuff I've read about Elliot Carter, he had um, difficult, I suppose it was difficulties in writing for the Brass Quintet, because he believed that the formation of two trumpets and the horn and the two trombones, it was too unhomogeneous. And he didn't really like mutes either very much. He felt that the use of mutes made it even less homogeneous. And um, really, for that reason, he sort of um, wrote it in a, a series of, I mean, it's almost like duets, um, duets with the horn being um, the, the linking member joining all, joining all the dots together, you know. It's, I mean, it's interesting when you look at the structure of the piece. I think he, th I think he thought about this very, very deeply, you know, and well, considered it a very serious piece. There's actually a kind of a, a program that he associated with the piece, a programmatic uh, way of looking at it, where uh, five brass players gather together uh, to play basically um, more chorale music, a chorale-like setting, and are almost immediately interrupted by the brass French horn player. And the first you know, 12 to 14 minutes of the piece is an attempt to get back to that music. This is from Carter. This wasn't our doing. This is what how he described uh, kind of the programmatic uh, aspect of the piece. Uh, and yes, it's a series of duets, trios, etc., uh, with various instruments being assigned certain intervals. And finally, uh, again, maybe a good 15 minutes into the piece is when the chorale actually starts, which was not only what uh, it was the first thing he composed of the piece, and this was the basis for the piece, was this music, this quiet music. Um, fascinating that a composer like Elliot Carter, fascinating to me anyway, that he came up with this kind of programmatic idea around the piece, which I don't think I would have expected uh, that would be on Carter's radar exactly to be writing in that way, but there, it certainly exists and it's, it's certainly in print somewhere how he conceived of the piece in that way. That's, that's really uh, that's really interesting to me, and um, I really want to move on from there. Thank you very much, Ray. I really want to move on to John to Ron, John Rojak on the bass trombone. And uh, it's, uh, John, it's very very nice to meet you at, at long last. And um, I, th I think you know um, one uh, one I suppose item for, item for discussion is the what, what what's the instrumental makeup of the of the brass quintet or a brass ensemble. And um, having a having a bass trombone on the bottom is is it very different to the tuba? Yeah, it's longer and smaller. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I first though nice to meet you too, John. I was wondering if everyone in Scotland, every brass player, has a museum in their home. <laughs> well, I wish I wish this was mine. I can tell you, this is. I mean, sitting in here in in this museum, it's it's like sitting in paradise. Um, you know, at home when I when I acquired another instrument, and uh, um, if I take it home, I have to smuggle it into the house. And my wife, if she spots them, she says, "Oh, what's in that box that you have found in the cupboard?" You know, I have to try and justify. But um, this is this is for me. This is paradise. Oh. And you, you, but you, you you see you see um what's what's um interesting to I mean I mean uh, what's interesting to me is that re really the the bass trombone it can it can it can operate in the same way as an instrument with valves with incredible in, with incredible fluency I remember there was all, all the debate about you know sort of um, can can you have a can you have a trombone playing in the playing in the the, the music of Victor Ewald and it seems that you can nobody's even sort of blinked an eyelid you know the trombones they seem to relish playing um, complicated music totally when um one, one of my favorite reviews that i got was um when we recorded on a 40th anniversary cd we recorded uh Evald's second quintet and the review in american record guide said that he never imagined hearing this piece with bass trombone on the bottom. And there are very few brass quintets that use bass trombone. Of those, I am one of the best. <laughs> I'm one of the best yeah. of the very few. 
Thank you. Uh, you scraped me. But uh, I also found out in 2005, there was a, an event in Boone, North Carolina. Uh, Alan and Ray were there. It was to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the New York, I guess it was 2004, celebrate the 50th anniversary of the New York Brass Quintet, who were no longer performing, so the American Brass Quintet performed. And we had a panel discussion, and sometime in the middle of that panel discussion, Bob Nagel casually mentioned that their first player on the bottom of the group was a bass trombonist. I said, whoa, wait, wait a second. All these decades have gone by. The New York Brass Quintet with the tuba. American Brass Quintet with bass trombone. How, how is this possible? Bass trombone, tuba, they're so different. And then suddenly he revealed that they started with the bass trombone. So I asked, I said, why did you change from bass trombone to tuba? And Bob Nagel, great icon of brass chamber music said, I don't know. <laughs> so there you go. Also, Sam Palafian and I had spoken for for a, f a number of years, but Sam, I'm still, you know, Sam, uh, you know, rest in peace. And Sam was a great friend, but I'm still waiting for about 20 years for him to return my phone call. But we had talked about <laughs> playing a master class together. We'd have a we would have a brass quintet, and he and I would switch up playing the same part to show to demonstrate what it would be like, the differences. And we were talking about that while we were playing a gig together and playing stuff. And we realized as we were playing more and more that ultimately it would be more about the similarities of the instruments than the differences. There's the range technically, it's just the timbre. So it's whether the timbre, bass drum on, it's much easier for the ensemble blend and difficult to provide that big foundation for the group to sit on and vice versa, you know, so those, those that, kind of differences. They're, they're, they're very small differences. Um, um, two years ago, it was, it was before the, this COVID outbreak, I went to, uh, I, I mean, I was down in the south of the south of um, the south of England, and I, I went and called on Elgar Howarth, um, who you, whose name, name you'll be familiar with as a, a brass arranger, trumpeter, um, big big influence on um, British brass ensembles. And um, I took Elgar Howarth a present. Now, the, the present, it was a Columbia recording um, on a CD, reissued on a CD, of the Gunther Schuller Symphony of 19, I mean, it's a 1950 work recorded in 1957 by Metropolis and his, I think it's the Jazz and Classical Brass Society of New York. So we, we sat and um, he, he really, um, he established this piece in Britain and um, knew it well and conducted it a lot. And um, I think he rather liked him hearing this. And he said, oh, this is very interesting. These players, they play, they play the Schuller with an American accent. <laughs> and, but um, but um, really a, a very, very, very um, compelling, uh, compelling and historic recording, you know, which um, I, I don't know how well it is known. But it's, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating study for me with all the, all the players that emerge from the New York, New York Brass Ensemble, et cetera, et cetera. It's quite an interesting historical document. But, you know, Philip Jones in, in London, when he sort of reformed his ensemble in the mid-1960s, he imported two players. He found he found a, a, a player who was um, very um, soloistic and very agile on the tuba, a little bit um, like Harvey Phillips, and, and that was John Fletcher. He found he found John Fletcher, but another import uh, import into the group was the bass trombonist Ray Premru. Now, Ray, Ray um, you know, for those who didn't know him, Ray was an American. He was an American who came to the Royal College of Music in the 1950s to study composition, and he stayed on as a, as a member of the Philharmonia Orchestra for many years. Um, I used to sit in front of him, and um, um, Ray Premru kept me in tune. I just followed him and um, I'd, I'd, I would be in tune. Um, but, but a wonderful musician, but with a, a, a slightly different approach to, to, to playing. Um, I mean, he was very dedicated indeed. 
that you know he was a player he was a composer he could play jazz he was very he was very versatile and that was really matched in a way to, um, by, by john fletcher on the tuba john john fletcher on the tuba john fletcher he could play in the orchestra but he, he could also play um solos he could play i mean he, he, i think he's probably his most natural habitat was playing chamber music john John, I think what you need to understand is for bass trombone and tuba players, there's so little else in our heads that to play different styles of music is, is the least. You know, we, we're not thinking about literature or art or anything. So to be able to just play some low notes in whatever style is, you know, there's it's nothing good. else in there. But, but but that's 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 what it's all about. That's what it's all about. It's it's team teamwork. You know, you can't you can't have a team without um, without a proper foundation. And it's a and it's, it's as simple as that. Now I I want to just um, change the I, I just want to change the topic a little bit. I've got one or two things more to ask, and I'll return to the bass clef, and I'll return to the bass clef, and I'll return to the trombone and the tuba in a little moment. But I, I really want to ask something of Simon Hogg. Um, so Simon Hogg, you know, Simon Hogg was a founder member of the Fine Arts Brass Ensemble, and I mean, I th I think you you founded the group in 1980. Is that is that that's correct? right, John? Yes, is that that's yes. correct? You. And um, that's right. And I, I really want to ask you what 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 stimulated you know, um, at that time you were you you were all at college you were either at the Birmingham School of Music and Stephen Roberts was a little bit older and he was a composition student as a postgraduate in Birmingham University. Now we what called was him it? Granddad. Granddad, oh that's perfect. <laughs> now now listen, what was it that fired you up? Well, John. Hi everyone. Uh, Thanks for putting this all together. Uh, we were all students. We were unemployed. Um, we were very young. I, I mean, it's we were sort of... Uh, Owen Slade, the tuba player, was still at school. He was 17. And uh, although Stephen was a little bit older, um, we, we were just... We were so young, so naive. But we were... Brian Allen knew us all individually, and he, he called us together, and we had a little had a rehearsal, and the first piece we played was, I remember, Comedia 4, and so we had this manifesto to create a brass repertoire to, to sort of, you know, to, you know, move the, uh, the literature forward somehow. But it all went horribly wrong because um, within a few weeks, this producer at the BBC at Pebble Mill heard the group, and he wanted half an hour's... Um, entertainment for a Christmas show. So Steve Roberts, um, we didn't realize he was a, an arranger, uh, but he, he knocked up some uh, uh, pieces for the group to play, Landlord filled the flowing bowl, uh, London Derry Air, things like that. Um, and we did a half an hour show. And so it, it turned into, although we did a contemporary piece in every single concert and we commissioned 60 pieces, we did, um, it would turn out more like the King Singers than than Philip Jones, if that makes any sense. Um, but it worked to our advantage because it meant that um, the British Council over the years were very, very generous to us. We did a concert at Wigmore Hall um, where we did a piece by John T. Harrison, I remember, and the Arnold and things like that. But as a result, we got a tour of India and then we got more and more work and ended up going to about 60 countries. Um, mostly for the British Council. I remember on one occasion, we went from Egypt to Syria through the Bekaa Valley, and we arrived in Beirut, in Lebanon, and the war was going on, and we had an SAS guard for the, for the week we were there. And then on the last day, they said, well, I'm afraid somebody's unimportant dignitary is coming in, and we've arranged for some gentlemen to take you to the airport, because it's very dangerous. This is Kidnap Ali. And... Wally Jumblatt's Drew's militia turned up in three cars with guns and bullets. And they, they had a, three cars. We went in the middle one. They were either side escorting us. And they had a mobile rocket launcher <laughs> in the back one. And they, it was fantastic. And they, they took us to the airport. Uh, on another occasion, we went to Malawi. And we spent a, 
a week with the military band and a week with the art uh, with the police band and i remember saying to some um dignitary some mandarin i said you know why are we here and he said well, whilst you are working there are uh, delegations and meetings going on because nelson banda will die eventually there'll be a coup and the british government want to have good relations with both sides so we were being used as a little bit of a political pawn sometimes uh, by the British Council, unbeknownst to us. Now, you see, it's quite interesting, the situations that we can get ourselves in, because, you know, just a, particularly uh, particularly as a brass quintet or a smaller group, you can go to those parts of the world that, that the symphony orchestras don't visit so frequently. And, you know, it, that really just, uh, um, I recalled an experience in Nigeria. In Nigeria, I mean... Um, oh, dear. Well, um, um, recall, I recall a workshop, I think it was with the Nigerian police band. And um, the Nigerian police band, they, they were very regimented. And I suppose, uh, I suppose it was uh, part of our philosophy in the Wallace Collection to, you know, just um, loosen, up, loosen up and loosen your limbs and um, breathe fully and, um, you know, sort of um, drop your shoulders and all this sort of stuff. And um, I was put on the spot to lead this um, um, workshop with a physical warm up. And there was I, I was, I was trying to do this um, slightly happy clappy happy clappy experience to get them all chilled out and the 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 commissar of the nigerian police band went with his hat and his epaulettes and um his buttons <laughs> up to the neck he was he was he was um a little bit less pliant let's say you know and uh, it was it was a it was a strange it was it, it, it was a it was a strange scenario the playing it was not developed Let's put it that oh. way. The playing was developed, and it would have been, I think it would have been a very hard job to change the culture, put it that way. But um, now, ret returning onto, onto topic, you know, um, I recall seeing the Fine Arts Brass Ensemble playing at a, 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 it was a conference of the International Trumpet Guild, and I think, I think oh, you were yes. fairly, um, fairly sort of um, early in your development, and um, yeah. John Wallace and I, we were the old boys, Either. We're younger than then, but we're, we were the old boys by comparison. And I think I, remember. I, I, think I remember you doing some uh, some um, Renaissance dancing. Um, am I dancing? Correct? Yeah, I, I think you would think. I, uh, no, no, I think you're mistaken, John. I mean, is it someone else? <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember doing the Renaissance dancing. Maybe the, you uh, did. I, I remember that occasion very clearly, and because uh, Harkin Harkenberger was there, yeah. and. Uh, Sandoval, I think, and uh, the Barbican. It was a fantastic, yeah. fantastic do. Yeah. What but, year was um, that, John? 86, 1986. 86. And um, I just, you see, what I remember, I remember that your presentation was so good. And um, I, I mean, I remember thinking, oh, this is re really fantastic. I think you were playing playing some music that was written by Henry VIII. And I'm sure there was some, I'm sure there was some sort of very deft choreography. And um, Yes, yes. It's a little bit embarrassing, isn't it? But uh, I think we probably did all kinds of cheap tricks like that. <laughs> but that's, but that's, that's, that's okay. That's, that, that's what's called um, engaging, engaging with an audience. And um, I think, I think, I think that's, a, 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 I think it's very important that we can be so versatile, you know, as, jo as John, John Rojak was talking about the versatility of idioms and styles. But I mean, I think we can be very versatile in our types of presentation. And that's a, that's a fantastic thing. Yeah, I think it's still very hard to market for us. Um, I'm actually involved with the Chamber Music Society in our in the town I live in, and you go to most chamber concerts, and it's a string quartet, it, it, and it's it's quite a big decision for them to to get brass in. Um, we always had a no depth policy uh, in, in fine arts, and and, and at least then you know there was some consistent you knew that sort of the people they knew the music it was well rehearsed and and um but sometimes with brass groups it's not the case often brass groups are made of the five best players in college and they all get work um perhaps because we lived away from london we were uh insulated from the or isolated from the the well-paid gigs the film sessions the nice stuff that might draw you away 
so we were able to to stay pure. That was what we did. Um, you need you need somebody to market the group. It's very important. You need a manager. You need somebody who can talk because by nature you're playing a number of fairly short pieces. Somebody who can be eloquent and and uh, speak with some knowledge, but also give the players a bit of a rest. So there's. Um, it's not just the five best players, is it? it, it there are, um, I, it's, it's a constant surprise to me that there aren't more brass quintets who make a success of it. And uh, unfortunately, there aren't. That's, well, that, that's very that's very interesting. You know, I, I think I think there are many groups in Britain that they 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 can specialise in playing the playing the encores, but they're not quite so interested in the real um, the real um, essence of the repertoire. And you know the the, the, the I, th I think there's I think there's quite a big repertoire now. I don't, I don't think the repertoire was so big in in some senses in the, in the 1950s, but uh, but it certainly is now. And I think there's a lot that you can do with it. You know, now I, I want to I want to I want to sort of move on to Tony George, and then um, with Tony George, I would really like to ask a little bit more about um, the the instrumentalists. Um, role in the brass quintet, you know. Now, you, you Tony, I, I think that you studied with um, John Fletcher at the Guildhall School, and then... a little bit. Yeah, I had a couple of lessons with him. Um, I was also lucky enough to have a couple of uh, lessons with Owen Slade as well, um, way back in 1983 when Fine Arts came down to Devon, which is where I used to live, and also in 1983. I was walking in my local, um, I suppose it's like a junk shop, and there was this record there which had this Swiss flag on the front, and it said PJBE on it. And I thought, oh, that must be really good. So I bought this record called PJBE in Swiss, and it was amazing because I'd never heard a tuba before that didn't sound like a tuba. It just sounded like an enormous euphonium with just this incredible clarity of sound. And it didn't dominate the ensemble, like sometimes other tuba players tend to. And as soon as I heard it, I thought, that's, that's how the tuba should be in a brass group. And I was lucky enough to sit next to Fletch when he was playing. And everything about him was about this incredible clarity of production, clarity of sound, and an incredible musical intellect. I see some of the comments are, um, you know, you'd have loved a career in the UK but can't drink enough, and that's because you don't play the tuba. Well, Fletch, <laughs> luckily, could do both. He could drink enough. Um, he, he could, you know, he could also play with his model, model railways, but he was also just the most amazing musician who happened to play the tuba. And because of him, I'm sure, because of him, there's a whole generation of tuba players who think actually playing in a brass quintet is quite cool and quite lovely. And it gives you a, an element of musical satisfaction that you just don't get sometimes in other things, like New World Symphony, for example. But there's also, you know, the music you get to play in the brass ensemble is just ridiculously interesting. You could be playing the Renaissance stuff that Simon dances to on a regular basis, although he doesn't tell us that he does that. Every Friday night, he does dress off and he dances. I've seen it. <laughs> but not only that, you get all this Renaissance music, you get the 19th century stuff, like the bell on and the Mima we're playing this evening, which is just amazingly engaging. And then you get the stuff like we were recording a piece well, last year by a composer called Francisco Cobb, which goes so low for the tuba part that the publisher kindly wrote all the notes underneath so that I didn't have to think about it. So we have all of this fantastic repertoire to play, which you never get to play on the tuba normally. So, yeah, the, the question was about sitting next to Fletch and having lessons from him. As I said, I only had a couple of occurrences of that. But everything about him was making the tuba not sound like a tuba, but like an enormous musical instrument. Aha! Is this the brass quintet in... Ah, oh, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, it goes quite low, doesn't it, John? <laughs> I think John's going to contribute. Just, to down, just down to G below the piano. Yeah, so it's not too low. I mean, that's, that's the low as uh, the rest. But um, you, you, actually, you actually played that? Can, yeah. can, can you play 
can you play the super low B for four measures and make a crescendo to triple forte? Because that's the one thing that I really have a problem with. Like, sing afterwards. It, it's easy. <laughs> no, it's, it's... You have to drink more. <laughs> I actually okay, 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 not drinking. No, I actually carry. Amazing. I actually. I actually carry this piece with me and practice it. It's amazing. In fact, we've got a recording of it. If, if that helps, and, I would and like it's, to hear. Uh, it's actually incredible because it sounds a little bit sounds like Miles Davis sketches of Spain. It's just hair standing up on the back of your neck. Good. I cannot recommend this piece of music enough to you. It's absolutely amazing, mm -hmm. uh, isn't it? He's it, it, yeah. a great young composer, Francisco Co. Yeah, yeah. A trombone player. Sorry, Simon and John. He's a trombone player. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and a very good trombonist as well. But he came to the academy in London, but he, we put him off a trombone, put him on to composing. Yeah. I, I think he let you in basketball teaching. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, it, it's amazing music. Uh, I mean, if you get a chance to, I mean, you know, I'm not saying that it's the world's best recording, but it is because it's the only one. Uh, the the Francis de Cole Brass Quintet, available through the Wallace Connection website, is a really good piece of music to listen to. And, you know, I mean, you won't be humming the tunes, but you really will enjoy the music. Anyway, getting back to the, what was I getting back to? Oh, yeah, having lessons with Fletch. He was amazing. And he is the, the, the reason that so many tuba players today play with such ridiculously amazing techniques and can do anything. And they make the, the instrument sound like, well, well, one of the things that's changed a lot in, in probably the last the, the last 50, 50 years is just the placing of brass chamber music in, in higher education. And um, r really, um, in, in about 1970, in, in 1970 the, the only place that really took it seriously was the Guildhall School of Music in London. And that's really because uh, primarily there was a special band set up by Dennis Wick, the trombonist, and um, a fellow composer, Buxton Orr. It was Buxton Orr, the composer, and Dennis Wick, the player conductor. And um, they, they played Gabrielli, they played Gunter Schuller, they played everything that was uh, was going. Other other um, higher education um, um, higher education institutions in Britain, they eventually followed suit. And most um, most institu institutions these days, they have brass, brass quintets and other ensembles as, as an accepted um, type of type of music making. Now, John, John Wallace, um, in the 1990s, when you were involved at the Royal Academy of Music, I think you involved Empire Brass. Um, as an ensemble in residence. And I'm just wondering, what was it that they had, to, what was it that they, they offered the students when they came? Well, I suppose the, the thing about Empire Brass at that time is that they were like rock stars. You know, uh, the first concert that they did at the Duke's Hall, there were queues around the block to get in to the concert and it was absolutely mobbed. And at, at that time, you know, uh, I, I suppose um, Rolf uh, was matched by the other players. I mean, Jeff Kerno was just, you know, unbelievable uh, trumpet, tr tr trumpet, trumpet player. And you had Eric Rusk, who was a phenomenon on the, on the French horn, could play anything on the instrument and it was it was Scott Hartman and then Doug Wright and then Sam Palafian and then Ken Amos took over uh, for, for, from him and um, I suppose they just had the presentation right and again it was this sort of vein of seriousness like they swept into a workshop and just took the place over. And in Britain, we tend to have a rather sort of amorphous view of keeping time and the bar line and stuff like that. And they had this relentless metronomic thing uh, going so that they could play, you know, pieces at a distance and keep totally together. And it was just this, uh, the tightness of the ensemble, but also the seriousness, I think, of 
uh, some of the repertoire that they played, like Mac Maxwell Davies. And although that didn't take up all of it, they, they, would, they did play it uh, for, 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 for us and the Tilson Thomas, a uh, uh, wonderful one movement piece that wrote, wrote for, for her. So um, it was the, I suppose, well, what I wanted the students just to get was something of the, the specialness and the, the glamour of 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 brass uh, brass music also um they were you know they were quite risky individuals that they took incredible risks in in concerts like you always felt somehow that rolf's lip was about to go you know and he did actually crack notes and stuff like that which you know there was this vulnerability uh, about uh, about him, but he always came out incredibly rejuvenated for the second half. So I wonder <laughs> why that was. And it, it was it, there was everything in their concerts. It was like a bloody human zoo going on in stage, and it was this sort of liveness that I just wanted the students to experience because so much of our music making isn't a yeah, we're brass players. We know our lips going to go. We pace ourselves. But the thing about Empire Brass is that they never pace themselves. And that's maybe why, uh, you know, a few of them burnt out a, a, a little bit quickly. But it is what you aspire to, to keep music, uh, mu mu music exciting. So it gave us a transfusion into our boring English way of, oh, sorry, our British way of, 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 of doing things. And it, and, it, and it gave this sort of cross current again of something coming from the USA that was so different of, of what we normally do. We risk averse Brits. Since um, 1990, there's been quite a big emphasis in the in, in the UK of um, of um, historically informed performance. Um, I think that I, th I think that in really in in, in 1990, I, I don't think we really knew very much about it here. But um, I think I think I think we followed, you know, um, the the brass players. They followed the prevailing tides of people like John Elliot Gardner and, and Roger Norrington, who formed new types of um, new types of orchestras. Of course, these 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 ensembles they were made possible by um, pioneers that were earlier, Christopher Monk and um, many of the people involved with the society. Um, but um, this, uh, um, in my opinion, um, the, the re-visiting um, re, um, the music of the 19th century, I think it's quite a big thing to us as brass players. And um, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm very aware of uh, um, an incredible thrust in this direction in the UK. You've, um, you've experienced some of that this weekend. And I'm just wondering if that is also the case in, in the United States. Alan, have you any views on that? Um, I, I would say it, uh, there is a good, a good deal of activity, um, which I'm not involved in at my advanced age, but uh, um, it's pretty spotty, I would say. Uh, Ray, you, you, I mean, we did some you know, Civil War music that you dug up. We played on old instruments, recorded. It was really fun and to play that 1870s distant cornet. But... We, you know, I don't collect instruments. That's not uh, my thing. Um, I, I would certainly agree with you, Alan. That uh, it's pretty informal. There's not a really a, a ongoing professional presence in in it the way maybe there is across the pond. I don't know, but not uh, not the same. I think. Yeah, we are we are a very large country, and so it's hard to, <laughs> <laughs> as Dennis said. <laughs> But um, but um, for example, the the American brass quintet it reestablished the performance of some of the Evalt symphonies in the 1970s, um, and um, you know the um, I, I, I suppose there was a keenness in the 1970s to um, to establish a balanced repertoire, you know. I remember those. Uh, I was in the group at that time. It was the 
1974, 75, right around that, that we, we started a series of concerts at uh, what was then called Carnegie Recital Hall, the small hall at Carnegie Hall. And uh, w the first season, we tried to have what we called all premieres. Everything we played for four concerts were, were uh, modern pieces that hadn't yet been premiered, were uh, um, editions of old music that we obviously played on modern instruments, but that were new to our repertoire. We were bringing new things all of all the time and uh basically we played all four of the ewald quintets so we we fudged a little on the first one i'm sure it had been played in new york many times but we played the other three which really hadn't been played in new york uh so it, you know the 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 feeling was um so in in the 1960s the idea that brass quintets would play arrangements and and uh you know versions of other classical music or was really not met with a lot of enthusiasm by presenters and, and managements. Uh, and the American Brass Quintet felt very strongly, we have to have our own uh, unique repertoire that isn't the music being played by strings or winds. And I want to say then, when I joined the group in 73, that was really this, uh, you know, was paramount. That's, we were not going to play music of, of others. We were going to find brass music. And uh, over the over the decades I was in the group, that loosened up uh, a lot. And, and I think the acceptance of that by audiences, of course, has become widespread. Uh, everyone here is brass players playing arrangements of things now, and it's totally acceptable. But I think in the 1960s, um, managements were very shy about that being something that they could sell. And I think the American Brass Quintet maybe was the... Uh, you know, the most radical about we're not going to veer from this, we're going to play what we would say is really uniquely brass music or very closely associated. Uh, again, it loosened up over the decades, though. And I suppose it's playing music that you believe in. Um, you know, it's um, just to contextualize that in Britain, Philip Jones, in all of his existence from 1951 to 1986, he never managed to um, put on a performance of the Gunter Schuller Symphony. That, that, uh, it, it was never performed publicly because I think he didn't believe he could ever sell the concert hall in any of his own promotions. He did, he did record it and um, they, he, he would play it elsewhere. Um, um, if there was a residency, it would be put on. But um, he, he, was a, he was a very conservative um, musician, but despite that conservatism, he managed to somehow or other um, amalgamate quite a full, um, full catalogue for um, for a series of um, re um, of records, you know, the, the the records that were they were always um, very finely balanced, and uh, I I suppose that one of his um, big successes was just um, somehow or other having the the um, this very astute approach to balance things up to make them attractive. You know, he um, he um, produced a, a a record called Romantic Brass. And, uh, and in Romantic Brass, there's very little on that um, record that's uh, original brass music. And I think we're aware of um, um, a lot more about this um, today you know, than, than then, you know. So re really, um, to, to, re to really round up, um, to round up our discussions, um, I just wondered if I, I, I could ask a general question um, of, the, of the panel. Um, where do you think that um, br brass chamber music, where do you think it's going to go next? Um, is it, uh, do you think we'll ad adventure into some new territories? So any takers for this question? <laughs> So it's quite a difficult one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go because I actually have to run in a minute. Um, what, what we've been trying to do, what I've been trying to do in our, some of our new commissions is try to imagine what the current state of the art or cu uh, cutting edge is. And I've been trying to get composers to write pieces for brass quintet with interactive electronics. Because I think, I think it's, the time has already passed for that. But... Um, it's still, you know, for classical, the, the slow evolution of classical music. Maybe it'll be okay to get a couple of pieces that way. And also collaborations. I've been trying to get um, some pieces written for combinations of, for example, um, brass quintet and string quartet. And to get savvy composers who don't think, well, my God, that brass quintet will just destroy the string quartet. You'll never hear them. Well, of course you'll hear them because the timbres are so different. 
Um, and this came about because a few years ago we won a, an award and uh, Chamber of Music America was going to put on a concert in our honor and they asked who had we collaborated with over the course of 50 years <clears throat> and we came up with like three people and <laughs> I thought it would be better if we collaborate with more other groups and musicians so trying to get more collaborative pieces and also with whatever the state of electronics I'm not so sure about mixed media actually what um, our first big event that was canceled because of COVID a year ago, March, was a piece by Nina C. Young that had electronics and in fact was uh, in a performance space where we would have recorded the music and also play it live. And there were going to be 350 small speakers around this hall. And um, the, the biggest reason I'm sad that <clears throat> we didn't get to do it is because I still have no idea what it was going to look like. Um, we were going to be in this space for about three or four days rehearsing it, putting it together. So I think maybe some of that stuff is where brass will go. And we're still doing the, the usual commissioning pieces. We've got about six coming right now. I'm, I'm very hopeful, you know, I'm an optimist, but um, Hindemith did a pretty good job in the 1930s with his music for brass and strings. And in the same way, you know, that was an American commission. I think that was his first trip to America. And um, because there was one commission, I think there was another commission followed by Kusevitsky for Boston at the same time. So, um, so I think that um, working with others, I, th I think it can be um, hugely successful. And of course, of, co of course, uh, brass, um, brass operating with 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 singers with choirs is I mean, that's a very established thing and something of, uh, that I'm very fond of doing you know so um i think i think um thank you any more comments from anybody well i think we'll, well i think it's time to wind up and um i would really like to sincerely thank the panel for all your contributions so thank you very much and um i hope we'll maybe see some of you in our concert this evening i better go and get changed into my bib and tucker for my next for my next um my next um job so thank you all very much Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks, Great to see everybody. Thank you. John, do you have a comment? John Wallace, did you want to say something? <laughs> well, no, I think the, the future is really getting more young children involved in the whole thing. And so, you know, we're doing a concert in a couple of weeks down, down on the beach with as many children as we can just playing shells natural trumpets and stuff like that and uh i i i like john i'm very um very optimistic uh, uh for the future uh tony's just started off 150 kids uh, during the pandemic online on these eight foot long natural trumpets and some of the kids are transiting onto trombones and bigger instruments and stuff and so we're hoping that when we come out of this we'll have these enormous spaced bands that's the great thing about social distancing we can do coro spezzati now and and in the in the great outdoors we're allowed to play outdoors we can't come indoors so it's great so come to scotland the hills are going to be alive with music <laughs> <laughs> brass music <laughs> right. mm. Okay, well, thank you very much to our panel and to John Miller for moderating. And um, I, we have a few closing comments from Jeff Nussbaum. Um, and I wanna remind everyone that there is a concert tonight on, it's on a YouTube link. You should have gotten that with your registration materials. If not, the link is on the HBS website. It's on the HBS Facebook page. 